we really, really appreciate all of the people that have come, not just locally, but from all over the country to be here with us today and last night. And um, I haven't had a chance to speak with every single one of you, but before people say, oh, I've got to run to the airport or something else, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being interested in our companies for, for investment purposes. Thank you for being inquisitive enough to ask the questions, could we make life better for other people if we try to do it this way? Um, as a mom and grandma, okay, Terry, thank you for trying to figure out if we can do something about ear aches for children. Um, all of those things are important. I also want to remind those of you that are going to be around on Friday that Friday morning from 9 until 12 is the last public um, Arizona Bioscience Week event. And I think to me it's probably the most important one. I love you, I love you all. But tomorrow is about the patients, and patients are the reason we do what we do. So I hope that some of you will be able to join us at Creighton University's New Health Sciences campus from 9 to 11. There will be more breakfast than you saw this morning. And um, also on top of that, um, we have two hours of rapid fires with patients talking about what matters to them. And then at the very end of the day, or that, that morning just before noon, we have the co-chairs of the State Bioscience Caucus at the legislature, and we're going to be talking about what we need to do in the future so to help patients. So it's really going to be a cool morning. And with that, I am going to turn it over to AZ Bio board member, and more importantly, friend, um, Mara Aspinall from Bluestone Ventures. And the, the neat thing is, is that this is our later stage panel. So uh, later stage means these people write bigger checks. And um, they also have higher expectations. Um, but more importantly, every single one of them has been a very, very dear friend for very many years. And I truly appreciate you all being here today. So thank you for joining us. And with that, Mara, it's all you. Thank you, Joan, and uh, thank you for your leadership. Um, I'm going to take my white hat off for the working part of this uh, moderating session. And it is great to be here and great to see all of you. Um, we are keenly aware of the fact that we are the very last thing in the day before drinks and food. So Joan, let me just check what time do we end? 5 or 5.05? Five? OK, bars open at 5, so we are going to um, be very aggressive here, and many of our questions will be what we call lightning round. So we will be asking questions quickly. Um, uh, a little bit of context. You know, today we're going to be talking about money. And for, throughout my career, we always had a debate. Is it no money, no mission, or no mission, no money? What we're going to say today is you need both. You guys need to work on the missions, as you did in so many effective sessions today and pitching that mission, but we're going to talk about how to get that money, not just in that early stage, but in the later stage. So we have three great panelists with us. And to break the ice, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, talk about what part of the ecosystem they are currently part of. But um, uh, I'm going to ask each of them, I only gave them about three minutes notice, to share something um, with this group that nobody else knows about them. And I'll give them one more minute to think about it, because I did this in a very large panel in Washington, DC, just before the pandemic. And one woman stood up and explained how she broke federal law and dug up a um, casket on Arlington or some <laughs> national territory. I had to like stop her mid-sentence and said, next. So my only rule is do not admit to any federal, state, or local crimes. Otherwise, we are fully good. And I'll start by saying um, Mara Aspinall, Bluestone Venture Partners, co-founder and managing director. Um, we've, it's a relatively small new fund. We have a third of our investments are in Arizona, already sold one, so we're feeling very proud of that. And um, also work on COVID policy with both the Biden and Trump administrations. Um, but what my little secret is, not so much of a secret, I have what I believe is the largest Oreo cookie collection in the world. 
about 545 pieces. Kirsten has seen it. Everything from cookies from 26 countries, Oreo Barbies, Oreo Hot Wheels, Oreo COVID masks, Oreo hats, and you name it, I have it from Oreo. So soon, I'm hoping to have a museum. With that, Andy, it's tough for you to top that. I, I, know. Can't, I can't follow that. <laughs> All right, no one definitely knows this because I just found it out. I get the hat now. It's a white hat. I did not get that. I was watching it. All right. I understand that now. So uh, Andy Lombard, CEO. I knew he was going to take that uh, off. Um, of ABC, we're a new uh, venture capital investment firm that does both fund of funds and direct investment. We're deploying $87 million, only Arizona. So if you're headquartered here or want to be headquartered here, uh, we are writing checks. Uh, we do write some larger checks, I guess, is the case there uh, from the fund of fund size. From the co-investment side or the direct side, we do um, up to $5 million checks, um, and that's it. Perfect. Yeah, so I guess uh, all the interesting thing about myself, I would say, uh, actually, originally, I did not speak any Chinese nor write any Chinese. I, wrote, I didn't speak Mandarin nor did I write any Chinese, and I actually had to learn through the school hard knocks, right? It was, uh, uh, I was in China for two years, and uh, all my classmates were, uh, they were all Caucasian or uh, from different parts of the country, and they ultimately all relied on me for obvious reasons to help them negotiate deals, like negotiate rent, but get them to determine what they wanted to buy, right? Uh, so uh, that was how I slowly learned how to speak Mandarin, right? <laughs> I love that. And uh, yeah, so, uh, and for Life Capital, uh, we were founded back in 2015 uh, under the mandate of investing in Asia and North American, predominantly, uh, predominantly uh, U.S. companies. Uh, and uh, we, in total, now manage about two billion U.S. dollars with our most recent fund close it, that closed uh, earlier this year at the tune of 935. Uh, we now have something like 20, 70 portfolio companies. I think the, more than 20 of them are public across Asia and North America, Asia and the United States. And uh, our minimum check size is about five million, and through the duration of the company, we would invest about uh, 50 plus. So, Jack, okay. uh, Jack Florio, uh, it was a tough question. I had to think about it a little bit, but I guess the one thing is, uh, I come from a family of Disney fanatics. Uh, if you come to our home, you will find Disney paraphernalia and artwork throughout the entire house. My daughter here in Arizona is 44, and the first time we went there, she was, uh, I think, three at the time, and we've been there just about every year since, many, sometimes many times a year. Uh, my grandsons now have been to Disney probably almost, almost as often as we have, so we're just complete Disney fanatics. Uh, my background is a little bit different because I've come from all three sides of the business. I spent 30 years at Lilly where I was doing a lot of business development uh, out of the business unit, but doing, working with the business development group, was we were licensing in and investing in things, uh, products and companies. And then in 2001, came out to San Diego, got very much involved in the angel side of, of the activities, where sort of involved with what was Tech Coast Angel, is now New Fund Venture Group for the last, uh, well, for the last 20 years, it's been New Fund Venture Group just for about the last year. And then I'm also an investment banker with Wheeled and Company, so we help companies raise capital. So I, I see this from a, for a variety of different perspectives, which sometimes is good and sometimes is bad. Perfect, thank you. And so as we move forward, I want to talk about how companies can get involved with later stage capital. Now, the amount of the check, I imagine, differs by industry. A biotech might be very different later stage than a device company. Um, there are a lot of conferences, it seems, for angels and early stage investors and a lot of friends and family. How do companies, how do you differentiate it and how do you meet the companies? Yeah, I will start with you. You've done a lot of these companies. How do you meet these companies? Do they come to you or do you find them? Uh, great question. So I, I would say a little bit of both, right? I think uh, a lot of these later stage companies, we certainly do track the progress of where, they are, where they're at. So, uh, so some of these companies, I think we've spoken to since 2017 and been just waiting for that inflection point for us to put capital mm -hmm. behind, right? So I would say, uh, but and, and it all depends on the situation. And if they say during the meeting, we, we, have, we take very meticulous notes. And uh, let's just say they were saying they were going to hit an inflection point in 2023. If they don't reach out to us and it's a company at the top of mind, then we would reach out to them and say, hey, what's going on? But, uh, but I mean, it's a little bit of both, right? Uh, 
but, but increasingly more, I would say, uh, there is also kind of a, a other firms also circle us in deals as well, and we also kind of circle them in, in, in turn, so. Interesting, so let me follow up on that, Jack, then I'm gonna to go to you with the same question. Um, but yeah, how often should an earlier stage company, you know, a Series A company that's promising, hmm. but is not ready for your investment, should they, you know, reach out every six months? Should they wait till they have an inflection point? How do they stay on your radar so you, they, you are ready for them and they are ready for you? Uh, so I think uh, road shows are always interesting, right? Where if they coincidentally are around the area, uh, it's always good to meet in person, right? But I think uh, by and large, like uh, there are some companies I get weekly emails on, and I think at this point, <laughs> unfortunately, I have to Delete. send the spam, right? Like, yeah. uh, and so I no longer get those emails. But uh, but I would say, I mean, if it, it, it it's a careful line to tread, right? If you hit major milestones, and every now and then I might say during a meeting, this is the inflection point we're waiting for, right? Uh, then that then definitely reach out then. Right? So I, what I hear is stay in touch, but not so much that um, not, you say mark as junk. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> Got it. Jack, how about you? I uh, think it's, it is conferences like this. I think we, we see a lot of companies, and it'll look for companies that I want to see early to continue to follow. I mean, I must have literally 500 <laughs> folders on my for different companies on my wow. computer that have accumulated over multiple years in the business. Uh, what's interesting about that, occasionally I'll get reach out, a company will reach out to me, I'll go back and look and say, gee, I saw this company eight years ago, and the slides look pretty much the same. So <laughs> that, that, uh -huh. that speaks to it. And, and so I mean, it, it, is that, it is these kinds of activities where you'll find companies. Also, if I'm looking at a particular space, I want to say up Google Alerts to see what's happening in the space, see who's doing things in the space. I mean, I wind up subscribing to things like, uh, there's a Bay Bio newsletter, which is San Francisco, San Diego, there's three of them. Huh. Uh, and, and you'll find information in there, and you'll see companies that are hitting milestones, doing interesting things, and, and reach out to from that standpoint. Because you really want to find companies that are, in fact, hitting meaningful milestones. Okay, and we're gonna come back to that because I wanna hear about how companies differentiate themselves in that pitch meeting. But um, sort of give you the heads up in the next question. But Andy, you've, see, you've done early stage deals, middle and late stage. Yeah, I think. What do you look for? It was earlier said, it was a great uh, panel. I think uh, many of the panelists uh, from the um, strategics, it's building trust. And that trust is a relationship that has to start early. That trust is about your current chemistry relationship, but more importantly, if you lay out milestones to, to the point raised, update on those. Update and have an opportunity to go back to those organizations that's building trust, that's building execution, that's building a lot of good faith. And I think that's, that's what the name of the game is. You know, if when we wake up in the morning, we kind of are like everyone else, I think, and that we don't want to wake up and have to work with people that are just not fun to work with. And frankly, you don't have the trust, you don't have the you know, chemistry there. So you want to count on those individuals that are going to be there. And that's usually on the later stage side, it's built over a very long period of time. It could be five years, it could be seven years. Um, you could have met these people at a conference and you're just figuring out your plan, you're going to do a little seed, and then all of a sudden you did your Series B, and then it becomes more of an activity like, wow, where, you know. But you don't want it to be like, I'm surprised at that mm -hmm. point either, because you don't want to just say, hey, remember me? <laughs> so that fine balance of not a weekly update, mm -hmm. right? But every once in a while, you meet a milestone. Hey, I'm just checking in and let you know how we're doing. And also changes in the management team, because yeah. over that period of time, uh, a lot of young companies might have a yeah. new head of something, sometimes even a new CEO, but at sure. least new heads. Is that a key time to check in? If it's, a, if it's a senior individual, if it's your chief market or chief medical officer, if it's your chief science officer, those types of things, I would say yes. Not every position, obviously, but definitely the senior executives, the founding team, this adjusted, and new ads. You know, we just added a PhD. We just added this individual. We're awfully excited about that. Um, adding to our AI and our ML, you know, that type of thing would be great, I think. I see a lot of nods on, on that one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But but I think it, on top of that is also developing relationships, right? So on top of the trust, right? There's also the, the relationship you have with them. And I think you, you alluded to earlier, which is uh, it'll be good to check in every now and then. It's, it's better to build a relationship and build this trust. Uh, and I think uh, it, it certainly takes a bit of time. But uh, uh, but I think the, the fear is, or not necessarily the fear, but every now and then there are those folks that just say, hey, I'm looking to raise money now, right? 
uh, like we were looking to close in a month. Are you guys interested? And they haven't spoken to any other investor, right? So, uh, uh, so I think it's more it's more of a kind of you have to dial it up, right? And just kind of keep communication, keep building the relationship, and uh, make sure to keep it warm, right? And uh, so speaking, you mentioned other investors. How important is the syndicate? Somebody comes and they're ready to do a Series B, Series C. They've only done angels or they've only done friends and family, but they're at a point now where they need 10, 20, 40, 50 million, or five to 50 million. How important is the initial investors? Is that part of your evaluation or not relevant? Oh, I'll take it really quick. I mean, I think it's super important. If you look at the DNA of a company cap table, you can find out a lot of information. And you could find out what you have an allergic reaction to mm -hmm. that you do not want to be around, or you can find out, man, I've got to do some deals with this team. They really got it going. And as you start to probe into that, you start meeting whether it's a team you've just invested with for the first time or you have a serial relationship where you're circling each other on every deal. It's super important to share that information. It's super important to be able to count on them. If they're going to stay on that board, if they're going to continue on, you want to know that they're going to have everything in place. And then last on that, you want to know that they didn't screw it up. Yeah. Because yeah. what happens is with these deals, you get right of first refusals, no, no offense on the uh, strategic side. I mean, I was a Motorola Ventures. <laughs> I, I insisted we had, you know, right of first refusals. And it's a tough thing for financial investors, right? And you got to weigh what that deal looks like and the construction of it as well. So I think the DNA in a deal is the DNA of the co-investors, and they become super important. So, Jack, do you yeah. see it the same way? Uh, I agree. The co-investors are extremely important. The co-investors need to make sense. There need to be some rationale for the investors that are in there, that, that there's some relevance to the business. I think it becomes very, very important. On the strategic side, thinking about you know with my work with Lily then and now, I mean, the strategics are getting better at not putting those kinds of things in. Right. They've all created their own funds. They all want to be right. part of the deals. They want to get their nose under the cover. And they realize if they get too deep into it, then they're not going to be able to attract yeah. other investors. And they're not, they're not in it for just themselves for the long term with the company. So I think they're getting a little bit smarter as far as that's concerned. I'm going to go back to your earlier question, too, in terms of what, what it, when a company comes to you. There's this also this balance of knowledge and humility that they need to be able to show. And, and, and the ability to, to know what they're talking about with their own therapeutic area, their own product, the market, et cetera. But then the humility to know when their knowledge ends. And I go back to maybe it's, it's ancient history of my days at Lilly when I was involved in the neuroscience business unit, and someone would come in and try to tell us everything in the world about Prozac and, and that marketplace. When we just, <laughs> we lived that marketplace. It was so important to the company that it was not a thing we knew, we didn't know about it, and they would try to impress us with their knowledge about that. And that, 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 that's sort of a turn off, if you know what I'm saying. It's, it's, a key, it's a key item for me, so I'm gonna just poke in on this a little bit. Um, founder and management team self-awareness is so important, and able to read the room is also important. So if you're going into Lilly knowing that they're you know, so focused on this and you naively go in and really spew it out, you're actually saying you didn't do your homework. Yeah. So that's a red flag for me right away. Um, I would also kind of poke in and maybe start another cycle of conversation around, um, had this conversation out in the hall, promoting while you're presenting versus giving factual information and being passionate. The scariest thing in the health industry as an investor is to see a promotion going on, a sales pitch, as opposed to knowledgeable organizational data, data that kind of goes there. And I think you got to pull yourself back if you're ever in that position. And if you ever get feedback from someone that says that it felt that way, Double it down because they're just being nice. It really felt that way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, Jack. I think to add to that, I think also, you know, you, you need to know who you're sitting in front of when you're going to a VC. Who are the people around the table? What is their background? Do a little bit of research on each one of them. Understand where they've come from, where they've been, what, what companies they've been involved in. You go into a VC and you're presenting, uh, you're an oncology company, you're presenting six slides worth of oncology market data to a VC that does nothing but invest in oncology companies. And they're, they're tuned out. I mean, they, they know the market. You wouldn't be there if they didn't understand that was an important market because they have 11 other oncology companies in their portfolio. I, I, and I'll add in my piece, I couldn't agree more. Um, Bluestone does life sciences in the mountain southwest. And I get people said, I went to your website. I mean, seemingly not generic emails. I went to your website, and we think you'll be interested in this internet gaming company. 
<laughs> Excuse me? So if you're ever in that position or you meet somebody at a conference, don't lie. Not that you would lie, but say, I hadn't had a chance to look at your website. Um, so if you're there, make sure then you're very transparent and engage them in conversation to say, does what I do have any interest with you, as opposed to just launching into it? Yeah, that transparency um, concept for a later stage company, it magnifies. Over time, you're going to have stuff under the rug, you're going to have warts, you're going to have scar tissue, you're going to have pivots, you're going to have just really wonky stuff that happened over what, seven year period, six year period? It could be a long time. Bring it up. Don't not bring it up in, in, if it's contextual. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying just throw yourself under the, under the you know, bus, but I am saying don't let it be a surprise, especially as you start to get into a serious relationship with a firm that's doing diligence, be upfront. So let's go from there, and yeah, I'm gonna to come to you first on this one, which is, because you talked about milestones, what do you do when you miss a milestone? You know, in an early stage company, it's kind of like a newborn kid. Um, they could be anything. They could be the greatest athlete, politician, brilliant, because they've got no track record. So it's all about the future. But you're going late stage money. You've achieved and you've missed. How do you deal with those misses? How should they describe them to you? Yeah, no, that's a great setup, right? I would say uh, it's good to see failures, even if they are failures. And I think the, it's, it's more the evolution of how the management team thinks, right? And then if, if some of the management team leaves because of it, but the core people are still there, that just really shows the dedication to the company, right? So I would say, uh, uh, as alluded to uh, earlier, which is, uh, it's good to see, it, it, be honest, right? Our due diligence, our due diligence package, like 50, 50 pages, 100 pages thick, right? Is that right? Like, Typical yeah. 50 yeah, for, for plus ours, pages? Yeah, like we're, we're, we're considered very in-depth. So, uh, so we know exactly, we know everything, right? So like uh, if, you, if you try to hide something, We'll, we'll figure it out, and if you're intentionally hiding it, that's bad will, so it's very likely we're not gonna invest, right? Yeah. So, uh, but, but, I, but, so it's good to be transparent. It's good to say, hey, this is, these are the problems we're having. Uh, these are the, and, and even more so, if you came up and said, these are the specific problems we're having, are you able to help, uh, help us do this? Or is, are, do you, are there any venues or any introductions you can make? And that's something that we love hearing as well, right? Because we even know specific. Even in a first meeting, even in an early meeting, if we went with you, could you help us? Or is it too early to do that in initial meetings? It depends on how the how the how the how reading the room is, right? If uh, if all they're as, if they're doing is asking, 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 then maybe not, right? But if mm -hmm. it's just, hey, I might need help here. It'd be great if you could help me out. Or if there's a two, three year relationship, and say, hey, could you introduce me to this multinational? Uh, if you have any contacts there, something more than happy we'd be able to help with. Yeah, I mean, some milestones you miss, and it's death. So yeah. 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 if that happens, it happens, and mm -hmm. it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I think when you do miss them, though, there are opportunities. And the opportunities, you, as you've alluded to, is at that later stage, what, what we're looking for, what investors are looking for, is execution at that point. Execution could be you made that milestone, or you're saying, hey, we missed that milestone. Here's the detailed plan that we have. What do you think? You know, this is the way we're going to go about it. Because you do want to see that thought process, as you said, of the management team and how they react to those scenarios. So in so many ways, it's good to find a plug into what were the failures, how did you guys handle that, is kind of the way we look at that. Yeah, more than trying to imply you had no failures. Yeah. And Jack, this goes to your humility comment. How do you, how do you see this? Well, if you miss a milestone, did you learn something from it? I've missed this. I understand why I missed it. I understand what happened. If there's some responsibility you have to take, take that responsibility. It could be market issues, it could be clinical issues, but understand why you missed the milestone and what did you learn from it and how are you going to do something different. The other piece, uh, to go back to something, and I'm no, trying to figure going. out where this plugs in, but, but you know, you'll be sitting down with a, with a VC and they're trying to give you some advice and you don't like their advice. Well, then you shouldn't be sitting at that table. And if you think you're going to take an investment from them, and not take their advice. I mean, it's a marriage. I mean, I'm married close to 50 years. It doesn't last for, it doesn't, you don't change people. You don't change your investor. Yeah, you need to yeah. understand if your investor has a different attitude about what you're doing, then that's probably not the money you want. Yeah. But what do you do if it's a small issue? Understand if they have a fundamentally different issue. They want to, they, they want to be out in two years mm -hmm. or they want to go uh, consumer and you want to go B2B. But what if it's a small issue? Can you argue with somebody in real time? in your meetings and say, I see it differently? Or do you be quiet and 
and not. You can argue in real time if it's a small issue, and you need to be, and you need to both be aligned on okay, why is it we disagree about this, and then how are we going to figure out over the next X number of months what is the right path? You know, again, I, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. It's just that, that, that obstinate disagreement and thinking, well, I'll, once we get the money, I'll change this. Hmm. There's, a, there's a couple of. Uh, <laughs> cool things, right? Like, so when I grew up in Motorola, it was warring tribes. I don't suggest that. That is product group against product group against investors, and it was just a little bit different. We got a lot done, but we did it inefficiently. Um, I actually would put kudos to Intel, where they really focused on intellectual honesty. And if you have a meeting, you're going to be intellectually honest and say, look, I'm not with you on this. This is not working. I don't think that's the right direction. Have it out. Have that discussion. And I think to your point, I mean, we want founding teams that are super strong, that look at it and say, well, wait a second, here's why we want to go in this direction. And there's that element of coachability in the discussion that's useful. And you know that they heard you, they're implementing it, and you can walk out of the room saying, OK, we think we've, we've gotten to a point where, OK, that's, let's go in that direction, move forward. But I think that intellectual honesty is a better move than you know, kind of Tit for tat. I and that's on both sides yeah. because you've, I'm, I know I've learned some things from the folks at the other side of the table that I thought were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you, you're, you're open and with humility. Yeah, anything to add to this? Yeah, so I, I think a, a big word is visionary, right? We're investing in visionary CEOs, we're investing in the team. It's a, it's a people relationship, like it's a people business, right? So, uh, so absolutely what, you, did, what you, you guys have both attested to, which is, yeah, we really have to look closely and on the coachability, on kind of if they take feedback back and forth, and, uh, and whether or not it's real open discussion or whether it's just it's a completely one-sided one in this case then. Yeah. yeah I'll just mention also, it goes both ways too. The worst thing we would want, right, if you're in a board discussion or in a, in a meeting, you've cut a deal, and you say, well, we think it's this way. And we're, we're coming from an area where we don't have as much or probably as in-depth of information as the management team. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, well, and they just say, OK, yes, we're going to fall over and go do it. And again, that's probably not intellectually honest, because they're probably going to say they're going to do that and do something else anyway. Yeah, well, I so think that's the So you want the pushback a little bit. You want the pushback. You want the conversation. I, I love that. So um, how, do you, how do you think about, well, I, two sets of questions here. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about it. One is how you work with boards. Um, particularly in these later stage companies, and if you see a company that in that early stage did not have a very sophisticated board, how do you come in without overwhelming and taking over the whole board, or do you want to take over the whole board, number one? And then something to think about is, do you have any nevers or always in your investment? But let's start with the board discussion. If you come in at a series B or C, a little bit later stage, you told us you look at the other investors. Um, how do you deal with the board? How do you try to change that? Is that part of your term sheet? Yeah, you want to start on this one? Uh, I would say uh, board composition is one of the most important things, right? Because they are the ones guiding the CEOs to success. So uh, I think depending on who the other investors are, there are certain people. Like, in most cases, you're able to identify who is the best board member to take this company to the next, next level, right? And who are not. And uh, every now and then, we would also emphasize that certain board members should not be there, right? And it's for the benefit of the company. And uh, so, but it is case by case. Uh, and, and we do observe on what, what should be happening and what should not. And we right. ultimately execute Very on personalized. That. Jack, do you, do you agree? I, I don't have as much interaction with that. I mean, I, I've seen situations where you see a board member very close to the CEO, if you know what I'm saying, and, and almost a yes man to the CEO, mm -hmm. and that's that's always a very uncomfortable position. That you, you need to you need to change your fix because you want the board to have the intellectual integrity to be challenging things in an appropriate fashion. You you guys always take at least one board seat. Do you sometimes come in if you're going to be the majority investor and go for more than one? We're situational. I mean, we write checks that are small and large, so, so it really, depends, so it really depends upon where the company is. And I think the, again, back to the board composition, which is so vital, is stage dependent. So if you're at a later stage, you really want to start to set yourself. We're assuming later stage means that you're probably 
I don't know if you're passing on a, on a purchase at that point, but you're thinking that it's M&A and possibly going public, maybe, at that point. Or at least you want to set yourself up for both where you're super strong um, in both regards. And for me, on those later stage, I'm definitely moving more towards independent board members, not just financial partner board members. Those independent board members become really, really important as you start to get those connectivities to um, different strategics, if, if you're looking to do different partnerships, if you're doing roll-ups, all those things. At an earlier stage, it's, it's really different. What I would look at a board and say, hey, wait a second, you got the same board member from the seed level mm -hmm. all the way to a Series D, why? They didn't put money along in, what's going on, mm -hmm. to the point where you have to kind of ask that question, that would be a, a red flag. I, would say. I think that's great, and I'll add my personal experience here. I think too few entrepreneurs think about this board, and you've heard from three investors here how important it is, and um, often you don't have choices at seed because the leading angel investor wants to be on the board, and he or she you know, insists on being there, friends and family, but um, have them on the board, but make sure you make it clear that this may not be forever. So many board members I hear are just shocked to hear that they're not wanted on the board. So maybe even in this early stage companies, have a board review process. Have a year, you know, a year, a yearly process where you sit down with your current board members and say, this is great, but if we're going this way, I'm probably going to need to replace you with an independent. So think about it proactively um, would be my advice. You guys with yeah. me on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, Excuse me, what about um, <clears throat> what I'd call always and nevers? And I'll, uh, I'm going to add what we do at Bluestone. And I hope this doesn't offend anybody. Well, one part of it might. But um, I was on the board of a public venture capital firm. In the end, Safeguard Scientific didn't do well. Oh, thank you. Um, in the end, but an important firm. We did a study of 90 companies over a period of 20 years. And you know what the single biggest determinant of success was? The CFO. It wasn't the CEO. It wasn't how quickly they, and this was IT and, and uh, life sciences. It wasn't how much money they raised. It wasn't that they were in California or, or any special thing. It wasn't their IP. It was the strength of the CFO. And I didn't believe this, but we went through it and through it and through it. So I'm going to say from Bluestone, we don't do deals now unless they have a CFO on board. Now, many young companies don't. You have a controller that you bring in occasionally. Um, so we could talk afterwards. But I'm going to say that's on my always list. On my never list, uh, so you can each give one and give you a little bit of time. Um, some of you may not like this. I, I won't invest in husband and wife teams or family teams. There are a lot of successful companies, but I have been burned in every single one of them. You know, some divorces, some affairs, just, just ugly um, when it doesn't go together. Or the husband and wife do so well, or wife and wife and husband and husband, they do spouses, they do so well together that there's no room for any coachability. So that's the bluestone always and never. I like that always one. Always and never. I like that one, and we would work on a secondary to get one of them out. So that would be how we would go <laughs> if we really love the deal. Um, always Arizona, always. It has to be Arizona. Okay, that, so that's an that, easy that's one. cheating. Come on, that was no, you said always Arizona. Amongst the Arizona companies. <laughs> okay, we know uh, that. It was easy. I agree. All right, let me do the never then. Um, never is a team we really can't, you know, believe in. Right? Either that's because they were not humble, they were not um, self-aware, they were not intellectually honest, or something like that. Team is so critical. We want that visionary team, uh, which is so important. Um, always, um, yeah, I, I'm You can gonna, pass uh, now. I we'll got to pass. Back yeah, I, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, I would so so life capital strategy has been oh, has been very global, right? We know healthcare is a global business. I mean, COVID nineteen is a perfect example of that, right? So I would say uh, for us, a part of our always statement just as one of our investment mandates is: uh, is this company can this company grow into a global company, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go expand somewhere or go somewhere, but you have this global ambition, right? That it's not just the U.S. but Europe, 
Asia, Southeast Asia. These are multi-billion dollar markets, right? So for example, looking at the total addressable market, it's great to see the numbers up there, but, uh, but sometimes they include Asia in there where they have no desire to really go there. So in reality, the total addressable market isn't really what they're saying it is, right? And that's also a red flag. I, but, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, and, um, uh, but uh, the nevers though, I would say, uh, yeah, I think, uh, both of you have mentioned great nevers. I think we, we have also encountered several of <laughs> those nevers, but, uh, uh, but I would say never, we would never invest in a company that uh, has uh, has never been completely straightforward with uh, with what's been going on Back internally. Back to trust. So. Back to trust. Yeah. Can, can, before we get to Jack on this one, can I just ask you a question? Yeah. This just drives me crazy. Companies that show the total addressable market and they show Asia and hmm. say we only need one percent of the Asian market <laughs> and we'll have you know five hundred million yeah. ever and of course we can get one percent. Mm -hmm. Do you? get that a lot? Does that bother anybody else? So it's funny because uh, Asia itself is such a, a Pandora's box, right? There's so hmm. many things that Council. could go, yeah. there, like there's so many things that could go wrong, there's so many things that could go right. And I think at Life Capital, that's actually what we do best, which is why we, we, we've been circled in, which is be, we, have, we have offices in Singapore, Shanghai, Menlo Park, and, and Boston, right? So, uh, and we even have had multinationals rely on us on identifying which companies they should talk Interesting. to, right? So because you can help them we, we, truly get into Asia. We, we tru truly, because here, let's pose this, right? I'll give you the story, which is, uh, if, you, if you go to China, if you go to Beijing, I remember uh, when I first went to Beijing, uh, there, there are these street carts, right? And there was this, uh, there's this like candy thing that you could get, on, get, get from it. And uh, I was like, oh man, it looks delicious. I should totally get it. And I had a friend that told me, no, 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 no. You'll be in the bathroom for ages if you get that, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it looks delicious. I mean, it, it's cheap. I mean, why not, right? But then uh, literally, you, I could have gotten food poisoning from eating that. And you really need a local person to support you on that endeavor. And I think Life Capital has been that, uh, that kind of a, a group that really supports that process. So, uh, I but, love that. But, but, but yeah, uh, immediately if we see something like 1% of China, like clearly they, like 1% of Asia, and clearly they don't know, like they need to, they need to do their homework because they might not even get their capital back. <laughs> Just yep, 1%. Exactly. So. Jack, you're never and always. Too many questions to, 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 to get back to. <laughs> this this, this, this yeah. morphed a bit. Wait, wait. The never and always, I'm more involved in the earlier stage companies, but the never is what you said, husband and wife team. It's just, it's just that's, a, that's, a, that's a never. I mean, always, it's not about the individuals on the board. It's more about, can I talk to the CEO and understand why those people are on the board? Is there a rational reason for the individual people on the board? Are they sort of filling in a gap that the company needs? What's the purpose of them being there? And so that becomes important. And if there's not a logical discussion about why they're on the board, then that sort of leads me to say, how do you put this board together? Was it a bunch of friends? Mm -hmm. Or was there a thought process that went into it? Um, there was a second question I forgot. I'll go to the last one. Total addressable market? Hate that. I mean, when I was at Lilly, we had 35% of the Prozac market. We did not have the, uh, the uh, SSR market. We did not have 35%. We had 90% in some segments and nothing in others. And if someone yes. doesn't understand the segments that they're getting the business out of, yeah. then they don't really have a business plan. And you, you never have this nice even market share. You are killing it in some segments and you're not getting anything in others. And you at least need to understand that or be thinking about that as you target the market. I remember what the second question was. You talked about, yeah. and I'll, then I'll keep quiet. Uh, you mentioned the whole integrity issue, and we got off the board topic talking about other people, but, but if, if you have to dig in and you ask questions and you find out there was something hidden, the discussion's really over. over. I mean, mm -hmm. it may continue for mm -hmm. another half hour out of politeness, over. but the discussion's really over. Right. Well said. That, that you become terrific. a too early company. Yeah, and thank you very much, but. So We're gonna I mean, watch the trailer. We, we, have, we have 10 minutes, I have 40 more questions, but let me open it up, see if anybody has a question, and we're gonna go lightning round here. Team, team, team. I mean, technologies, it's important. We wouldn't be there if we didn't love the technology. It's, it's the team. I, I, I mean, team I'm- Team first, I, technology second. Yeah, but I mean, team way up here, like way up here. I, and and that's, that's an absolute always for us, has to be, 
has to be coachable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. He needs help, so we really appreciate I that. I need a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, just to reiterate the question, that was uh, uh, with respect to, I, I got so enamored by your answer. Oh, uh, sorry. I was like, <laughs> man. <laughs> just no, say we yes. Can, yes. We, we, can go, we, got, we got it. We can go on to the next market. one. Other yeah. questions. Uh, I would say team, you know, I'd reiterate, team, team is always more important. I think, uh, I think I was speaking to someone else uh, from the audience earlier, and it was just, uh, uh, I could, I'd invest in an A team and a B technology uh, yeah. rather than yeah. a B team than mm -hmm. with an A technology. Mm -hmm. so. All day long. Absolutely. All day long, yeah. 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 Fully. One. Over here and over here. Qual the question was qualifications in a good CFO. I'll start here if you're thinking. We don't all need to answer. But for me, is experience, experience, experience. It is not a role that you can teach somebody. And too many companies think you can, because you get somebody who's great with the numbers, you get somebody who's a fantastic controller. Um, you need somebody who knows what to do and has got their own Rolodex to be able to raise money and deal with banks when you've missed a covenant by a day or you've missed something by a tenth of a point. Somebody who has done it before, um, I can't emphasize that enough for me. Yeah, for me, check the technical boxes because that's a requirement. Whether Baseline. Baseline. And, and if you stop there, you're making a huge mistake. CFO is a strategic, vested individual that is coming in to make a difference in your company, not just on providing you with financial reports. It has to be a strategic partner. And if that strategic partnership does not occur within that management team, you're done. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly with that, and I carry the same thing over to your, your chief counsel. The chief counsel also has to be strategic and part of the business and not a no man. But let me ask you that about counsel, because that's an interesting one. Very few companies um, use their uh, expenses to hire somebody internally to be chief counsel, should they? And if they do, should they be an IP person or a general counsel to work on contracts or an outside relationship? Situational. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it, you, your general counsel There's could no be quote right unquote answer. outside, but the outside person that you get to your point needs to have some business relevance. Right. It's not about like this is the letter of the law. Now, there are some issues where you need 100% go after it, regulatory, legal, right. changing policy, changing environments like um, that uber uh, what's her name I'm sorry she's so fantastic uh, the general counsel ex general counsel of uber just laid it out and you could tell when she spoke she nailed all the regulatory stuff she nailed all the boxes that needed to be checked technically but she dove into the business and was an asset in growing their markets every single time and that's how they expanded so they knew the market they knew itself it, yeah. yeah so two last questions intellectual property for a while, every you know, you needed IP to really get venture financing. My sense is it's less important now. Do you is that also situational? Is that an A issue for you or an A minus issue or a B? Yeah. It's A for us on certain segments. You know, I can't. Uh, obviously, we're we're across the board. We're not just healthcare. SaaS company, I could care less if they're wasting money on. On IP, I'm going to say, why yeah. the heck am I'm I doing talking this? Biotech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. biotech. For there are segments that you can look at. You know, you, you look at the IP and you're saying, well, somebody's going to get around that. Who's going to actually get to first to market? Is there a business team around that? And then there's other stuff that if you're investing years of research in a molecule, you want to know that that's going to last a while. So I think that there's a situational. Yeah, you see it the same way. Yeah, yeah so I would say like, uh, so AI company for drug discovery, sometimes that secret sauce is best kept secret sauce forever, right? Uh, but there are also some companies with tangible assets that do require patents. And yeah. one issue that we've actually seen, uh, uh, even with groups that have signed with these like top, top law firms, is they forget to patent China, right? Or they don't. <laughs> they yeah. completely ignore China. And even and also, it's it's a notorious issue with academic institutions is they just completely ignore China, which makes sense, right? Because I mean, they might not have enough capital to cover everything. But I think nowadays in this global marketplace, that's also a never. Right, which is if it, we need to have global protection. Asia is no longer just a small market, even with this current geopolitical situation. Like uh, China is not a small market. Like just to, for the geopolitical thing, I mean, if you just look in the last year, the top five pharma companies have done about maybe 30 deals in Asia now. Right, 
uh, cumulatively easily four or five billion dollars that some of them don't even disclose. So Asia is very relevant, even in, in this geopolitical situation. And I was just going to say, because yeah. there are a lot of companies, just I had a meeting earlier today, um, that everyone's very worried about doing a deal with China, because what if there is a war? Mm. Is that not? Is, uh, uh, I don't want to put you on yeah, the spot yeah, here. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, no, no, of course. I would say it's a... Uh, um, Maybe it's that, not that's a, a lower, war, but yeah, no, it, yeah. Like a, there, there are a lot of geopolitical issues out there. As an investor, we need to navigate it appropriately. <laughs> like I'll leave it okay. vague. I'll okay. leave it vague. But I, I'll, the, I'll leave, yeah, uh, yeah. leave it at that. Well, here, here. I'll, okay. Okay. So, so I think uh, the, the Western companies are still very interested in bringing these com the, bringing these products over. Uh, there are maybe two or three main areas of risk that could be mitigated by moving those operations here into, here into the United States or a friendly nation, friendly nation according to certain things. Certain, yeah. certain well, it's sort right? of like Brexit and the UK. Mm -hmm. A lot mm -hmm. of companies you know, now have something in mainland Europe uh -huh. to have dealt with Brexit, and now it's kind of coming back together uh, a little bit. Correct, but, but I would say the level of interest is still outstanding. Yeah. So. Got it. So last question, our last three minutes here. Um, the macro environment, the economic environment. We had two great years, huge investments in every part of the um, digital health, devices, biotech, pharma. Looks like it's a tough year, clearly. SPACs are challenged, IPO are challenged, and venture capital, I think, and private equity still have money, but it's a lot harder to get it. What one piece of advice, and we'll go this way, would you have, you each have a minute, what one piece of advice would you give a company trying to raise money today in this tougher environment? And let's focus on biosciences. We're okay um, now. IPOs are going to be tougher, so down the road it will be tougher for exits. Powder will eventually start to wean a little bit, but the fundraising has been so significant over the last several years, we've got plenty of time. So my advice is to just button it up. Uh, make sure across but the board. But not meaning conserve I, across, your cash now? No, just across the board. Yes, part of it, conserve the cash. Be prudent in terms of how you're, you're looking at your execution plans. Button up your communications with your investors, with your deal, you know, deal flow, everything having to do with fundraising. And be clean about it. Don't you know, say, well, I'm just going to go have that conversation to have it be prepared every single time you go into those discussions because you just don't know. I mean, right now, I'll go into a discussion, someone's not necessarily raising money, they're thinking about it, and I'm like, oh, I really like it, and then we start to do a deal. Yeah. So it can so happen that way. Start early as And well. then be realistic. Just be super realistic about the time frames it's going to take, because it's going to take longer. It's going to take more meetings. Your valuations need to be realistic as well. That's already starting to, you know, come around. Um, and just know that you can do it. Just, again, be professional and, yeah. and get it executed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, all the above, right? But I think you hit all the major notes. I would add, um, uh, on top of just being being very lean about things, it's also, I'll give you an example. Dur during COVID-19, a lot of U.S. companies weren't able to do clinical trials, but China was still open. So uh, the companies that moved their clinical trials over to China were, didn't get that big of a hit on valuation when they came out to go raise capital because they had additional data, right? So I think uh, uh, my, my uh, I'll, I'll be vague on this as well, which is be creative, right? There's a lot of interesting things going on, and right now is a key point to differentiate yourselves from your competitors. So, uh, so I'd say uh, there are always opportunities, and there are always uh, there's always money to be made, right? Uh, the question is whether or not you take these opportunities. Yeah, yeah. money to be made and money to be found. Money to be found, yeah. Uh, Jack, agree last with word here. Focus, focus on what's going to be value added yeah. for your company. Make sure you're not you're doing the things that are going to be value added, and then understand where your competition is. Because at the end, when all this dust settles and things are going back up to normal, you want to make sure you're ahead of your competition. So this is an opportunity to maybe close some of that gap behind some of your competition. Yeah, I agree and competition meaning directly in your therapeutic area, and competition in terms of just other companies raising money in the field. Yes and yes, competition for for raising capital. We're going to go through this period. We're going to lose some good companies, which is unfortunate. We're going to lose a whole bunch of bad companies, which is probably okay. No, really. Yeah, and we're yeah. going to be a strong industry. It's a culling out of, it. of the herd. Yeah. That's right. So um, with that, it is 5 o'clock, and we're going to have the pleasure for drinks and hors d'oeuvres. Um, welcome Joan back again. And most importantly, thank our panelists for a great discussion. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So I echo that, Mara, Andy, Yao, Jack, thank you so much for sharing with us. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today, for sharing. Now, did, who can tell me how much money, what companies that have presented at White Hat in the last couple of years have gone on to raise? Who can tell me that number? Free drink. $1.6 billion. Okay. But think about the companies that you saw today. As you continue to build relationships with them, I'd like to see that number the next time we get together in a couple years go up significantly. And it happens when you build relationships, when you take advice, when you share data, when you get connected. It also helps when you leverage the resources that are available to you, which means that if you're going to JP Morgan, you let Joe know you're going to JP Morgan, and I'm on the selection committee for a bunch of the investor conferences there, and I can pick up the phone and say, would you please, Sarah Jane, would you please make sure that David Larwood is accepted for biotech showcase? And Sarah Jane will say, oh, of course. Right? And so Mary's the same way. We know a lot of the same people. So it's very, very important that you leverage the connections that you made this week. It's very, very important. Pita is here. She and I have connected at multiple venture conferences over the last six years, maybe? Ten years. And I didn't think you were that old, darling. And so, you know. Those relationships build and we come here. Chris UIC sitting in the back of the room, he's got the same kind of an address book as far as friends, not just here, but all over the country. You have to build those relationships. You have to work those relationships. You have to share. If, you have, if you're an AI company and you met other AI companies here, okay, you need to share your networks. You need to talk to each other. You need to see how you can collaborate. I know Kai Pham is over here, and he's got one of the nicest looking board of directors and advisors list of a company at that stage that I've seen in a long time. If you're an AI company, you should be talking to him because he's connected. So you start to help each other. And I can tell you that back in the day when there was a very insane time in my life when I acquired or was part of a team that acquired 40 companies across 63 countries in 10 years. It's not something I ever want to do again in my lifetime. But the way we were able to do those deals was because we all knew each other. We knew who was doing what. We knew how to collaborate. We knew who could get things done. And it happened. And that company grew from 500 million to 20 billion during that 10 year period of time. So you can do these things if you work together. Here in Arizona, we talk about having a collaborative gene. Activate yours. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the cocktail party. For those of you driving, you have two drink tickets. Please be careful. And um, have a wonderful, wonderful thing. Thank you for being part of Bioscience Week. And some of you I will see tomorrow morning at Voice of the Patient. Thank you. Before we leave, let's all thank, thank Joan for thank another you, outstanding yeah. conference.